Well, it's a privilege to be with you here this evening in Kennaway to open the Word of God and to consider it together. I have to confess I have struggled in preparation for this meeting this evening. It's with a great sense of inadequacy that I come among you tonight, coming from a place of sadness where we've known sadness recently, coming to a place where you've known sadness much more recently, and a great sense of loss as another one of the stalwarts, one who's been the backbone of the assembly for so many years, has been called home to glory. And for him it is so very far better. But we're conscious as we come among you tonight of <clears throat> your own need as, a, as an assembly and of Jeanette and Lorraine and Johnny and the family. And you're very much in our prayers at this time. I wanted to bring to you this evening a, a word of comfort and of encouragement. Uh, and I suppose we could have turned this evening or we could be turning to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1 and remind our hearts of what Paul would say there when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. And we could remind ourselves of the comfort that the, uh, of the one who is the God of all comfort, that we have known that comfort over recent weeks. And we can come to seek to bring you a measure of comfort this evening and the assurance that the God of all comfort will comfort and sustain and help you in the days that lie ahead. I want to say quite freely that my thoughts have been rather chaotic this evening. My mind has been all over the place. It was just before the meeting that I had any semblance of settling on anything for speaking in the meeting this evening. There's so many things been going on. I thought this evening we could have dwelt on and thought upon the, the certainties that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus, the things that are sure and steadfast and certain. The fact that this evening we have unlimited access to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4, let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we might find unlimited resources, unlimited grace, unlimited mercy for every time of need. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that this evening in heaven we have a sympathetic high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who's touched with our sadness, who's touched with our loss, who's touched with all that we're going through. And from him, there is grace and there is mercy to help. I thought we could have thought about an unbreakable promise and an unshiftable anchor in Hebrews chapter 6. An unbreakable promise that comes from a God who cannot lie. With an, unsh an unshiftable anchor that is as an, uh, uh, the, the, the hope that we have, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, that enters into that within the veil. Whether for us our forerunner has already gone, even Jesus, 
made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We're back to our high priest again. And we're back to the person of Christ. And he is the one who is our forerunner. And he's the one who guarantees that we too will come safely home to the harbour of heaven. There's no doubt. No question about it. Because it's an unbreakable promise from a God who cannot lie. He's promised whoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thinking about what lies ahead of us, and thinking we could think about an incorruptible, undefiled, unfading inheritance that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, that's reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept. by the power of God. Isn't it great that we don't do the keeping? Isn't it great that our salvation does not depend on us? How, isn't it great that our salvation doesn't depend on the strength of our faith and the steadfastness of our faith? But it depends on the, 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 the one who keeps us. We are kept by the power of God. That that faith that is shaky and that faith that is feeble is placed in a God who is beyond our, uh, uh, be, beyond our imagination and beyond comparison. And he's the one who does the keeping. I could think of an indissoluble house or the, the, the tents that we live in. The bodies that we live in, well, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, we know. That if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And it's certain. Oh, there's so much uncertainty in life, isn't there? Uh, and so much uncertainty in the world around us. And everything that we see around us it, it is temporary, as Paul would speak about at the end of chapter 4. But there's an unshakable certainty that when, when the earthly house of, of this tabernacle is dissolved, or when the Lord Jesus comes again, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In the present, we have an unceasing renewal. Unceasing renewal. Though our outward man perish, and we feel it, and we see it, and we're so conscious of it, yet our inward man is renewed. Every day, a constant source of renewal. Or we could think of an unshakable kingdom in Hebrews chapter 12. And we can think of the present implications of all these things for, for our lives. The, 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 the present, the, 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 the kind of people that we should be, the holy living that we should engage in, the hope that we should have, the joy, the rejoicing in our hearts. Instead, my... Mind has been drawn this evening to the book of Revelation. And I haven't been able to escape it. I've not been able to get away from it. So I, I, I am aware that, again, it, it might be scattered and chaotic this evening, but I trust, with the help of God, that there'll be something to encourage us and something just to, just to rejoice in this evening. Let's read in chapter 1. Just a couple of verses here just now. <clears throat> Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. 
verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, or the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I want to think about, uh, think with you this evening that underpinning all the things that we've spoken of so far is an unchanging and an unchangeable God. An unchanging and an unchangeable God. An unsurpassable God. He is the Almighty. Nine times over in the book of Revelation, do we have this word almighty? It's hidden in one occasion in chapter 19. It's translated instead omnipotent. Well, that's really just the Latin, omnipotens. The Greek is uh, pantocrator. We'll stick to the English. It's the almighty. The almighty. And that is unfolded to us in this book of the Revelation. That the God that we have come to put our trust in, the one of whom it was said to Ruth, the God under whose wings you have come to trust, is the one who is the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Eternal, the Unsurpassed, Incomparable God. It was Jonathan in 1 Samuel who did what his father couldn't do, and he came and found David. And he went to see David in the wood, and it says this, that Jonathan strengthened his hand in God. I just want to strengthen our hands in God this evening. I want to think about this, these verses just for a few moments, the, the one which is and which was and which is to come, and just to unpack that a little bit. But the Revelation, the book of the Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it reveals Christ to us throughout the book. And if we need anything this evening, we need a fresh vision of Christ. And we need to fix our eyes upon him. What was it that uh, the writers of the Hebrews said? Looking off unto Jesus. So, so consider him, lest you become weary and faint in your minds. Let's lift our gaze this evening. Let's lift our gaze from the present sadness. Let's lift our gaze from the present chaos in the world around us. To the one who sits on the throne the rainbow circled throne, before which is the sea of glass, untroubled by any turmoil or wind or ripple of disruption that this world knows so much about. Let's think about the one who is and was and is to come. It's the name Jehovah, isn't it? It's what the name Jehovah would signify to us. One of the explanations of the word, I don't know whether it's the right one or, or, or whether it's just, um, uh, um, just a good one, it, it is that in the name Jehovah, you have the three parts or, or the, the three kind of tenses. You have the future in the je, and you have the present in the ho. And you have the past in the ver. And so in the, in the very name that God would call himself by, you have the one which is to come, and who is, and who was. He's the one who is. And really, he's the only one who can say that. You know, we can't say that, really, because we're creatures of time. And we're creatures of either the future or the past, because everything that, that, that we have is either something that we're going to do or something that's already happened. And the present for us is already past as soon as it's been here. And so we're creatures of future and past. And for us, really, the present is, <laughs> it, it is unfulfilled future or fulfilled past. 
But God is the self-existent one. He's the God of eternity. He is the one who revealed himself to, uh, to Moses as the I am. He's the one who revealed himself in the New Testament as the Lord Jesus, the one who is the I am. The one who has life in himself. But he's the one who revealed himself to Moses as the one who was, isn't he? Wasn't it Psalm 90, the psalm that Moses, uh, the psalm of Moses, the man of God, that begins this way, that says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought, on, uh, brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting. That's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our comprehension, isn't it? We, we can't think, we can't imagine everlasting. We can't imagine a time when the world was not. We can't imagine a time when the things that we see all around us were not in existence, but before everything else was, God was. And he's the one who is from everlasting. And he's the one who is too everlasting. Oh, we could go so many places in the Old Testament, couldn't we? Uh, and just bring these things out. But we could come through to the New Testament. And of course, the one who is the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New. There are three distinct first chapters, three important first chapters in the New Testament that bring before us the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in particular. Apart from this one, this is the fourth, I guess, and it brings them all together. There's John chapter 1. You remember what John chapter 1 says? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. John 1 tells us of the one who was. Brings before us the one who was. What about Colossians 1? Colossians 1 says this, who is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him were all things created, and so on. And he is before all things. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. John chapter 1, who was... Colossians chapter 1, who is? What about Hebrews chapter 1? Hebrews chapter 1 will bring before us, yes, the one who, um, who, who um, upholds all things by the word of his power. It brings before us the one, who, um, the one who purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. But listen. To verse 8, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they, shall, uh, they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. John 1, who was. Colossians chapter 1, who is. Hebrews chapter 1, who is to come. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the new. He's the one who says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says it in verse 8. He says it in verse 10. He says it in chapter 21. He says it in chapter 22. I am 
the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And he's the complete revelation of God from beginning to end. He's the one who revealed himself when God spake in the beginning. Who was it that spake? All things were created by him and in and for him. In him all things consist. He's the one who revealed himself in creation. Who revealed God in creation. And he's the one who reveals God in all perfection. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's interesting, isn't it? There are four occasions in the book of the Revelation where this phrase or where a phrase similar to it, which is and was and which is to come, uh, occur. It, it comes in chapter four. And in chapter four, we find the the song that has been going on for, oh, since the beginning of creation, isn't it? It's the song that Isaiah heard in chapter 6. The proclamation of those angelic beings when they cease not to say, day and night, they, say, they rest not day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. It brings before us a God of uncompromising holiness and the perfection of his character, and the singularity of his character, the one who is separate from all others, and the one who is separate and distinct, the one who is holy. All the implications of that are seen in this book, aren't they? The implications of that are seen as God steps in, and the Lord Jesus in person takes dealings with this world that is ripe for judgment. We'll think about it shortly. But here, this song that has been going from the beginning of creation. And it says in verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Ever thought about that? Why did God create so many stars? Why did God create the billions upon trillions of stars in the galaxy, apart from to show us just how insignificant we are, how vast the universe is, how great God is? Well, this it tells you, for thy pleasure they are. For the pleasure of God, the creation has its being. And whether it is the, the, the greatness and the vastness of the unit, uh, universe, or whether it's the intricacy and the minuteness of the things that are microscopic, whether it is the things that are moving uh, uh, about at a level that we just cannot see, it was all created for the pleasure of God and for his glory. And he deserves to receive glory and honour and power and the ascription of that from us as well as from angelic beings. This is the God who was. This is the God who created. But we can look to the future in chapter 11. In chapter 11 is when the seventh, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. You know, there are the seven trumpet judgments, and here is the seventh. And this isn't the very end yet. There's still the bold judgments, the vile judgments to be poured out. There is still the coming of the Lord Jesus uh, to come. But listen to this. The seventh angel sounded, verse 15, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their thrones fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. And even though at that particular point, there is still chaos, if you like, on earth, the absolute certainty of the fact that God is in control of the kingdom, 
and he will reign for ever and ever. He's the one who is to come. And again, there's praise and thanks that is raised to him. But when we're in chapter one, we're in the present. We're in the present. And in verse 4, John's writing to the seven churches which are in Asia, and he says to them, Grace unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. And we can have great encouragement and great um, consolation as we consider the great God of eternity, the God who's created all things, the one who is all-powerful, the one who sustains everything. And we can have great hope as we look to the one who, it, 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 who is to come, who will take the reins and who will reign forever and ever and ever. But what about the present? What about present need? What about present tribulation? What about tra present trouble? Says so John, and I don't suppose, I don't think it's any, uh, it, it's any accident, is it? That the aspect of God that is emphasized here, or the aspect that is first, is the one which is. Which is. See, that's what we need. That's what we need right now. We don't need a God who was, reverently speaking, if you see what I mean. Or, or a God who will be, and will be forever. We need a God who is. And he is the God who is. And he doesn't just say it once in this chapter. He says it twice in this chapter. And I was thinking, you know, who was it that this vision, this revelation of Jesus Christ was given to? Who, who was it committed to? Who was it who wrote it down? Well, it was John the Apostle, wasn't it? You know, John the Apostle had known his fair share of bereavement, hadn't he? Early in the days of the, uh, of the early church, he lost his brother. His brother was taken. His brother was killed by Herod with a sword. James, the brother of John in Acts chapter 12, was taken. But by the time John's sitting down to pen his revelation, I judge he's the last of the apostles left. You see them go one by one. And Peter's been crucified. And Andrew's been crucified. And James has been, I can't remember what happened to James. Uh, and various others have gone and Paul has been beheaded. And John's here. And he's in exile. He's on the prison island of Patmos. And he knows what it is to be alone. And he knows what it is to be sad. He's also, if the commonly accepted date of the end of the first century is correct for the book of Revelation, he's also seen the destruction of the temple, the scattering of the nation of Israel, the awful and the horrific things that happened to them. And surely that must have weighed heavily upon him. Who is it he's writing to? Well, he's writing to these seven churches which are in Asia, these seven literal churches that were around at the time, that these seven representative churches that, that, that bring before us the different experiences and the different kinds of situations that we would pass through as the people of God. But they were literal churches. And he was writing to a church that was, that was about to suffer intense persecution. And he was writing to another church that had already known what it was for one of their company to have been martyred. And he's writing to those that are battling adversity. To those in Pergamum that are, uh, Pergamum that are, uh, that are, that are living in a place that is called where Satan dwelleth, where Satan seated. 
and it's the seat of the imperial cult, and it's the place of the Pergamon mysteries, and it's a place of the occult, and it's a place of darkness, and they're there in the difficulty and in the adversity. There are those that are struggling to maintain testimony in the face of false teaching, in the face of gross immorality, in the face of false profession. Sardis, thou hast a name that thou livest and a debt. There's a few names in Sardis, a few names there, a few names struggling to maintain testimony in the darkness and the departure Struggling to maintain testimony despite the apathy all around in Laodicea. Struggling to maintain testimony small and weak. And just trying to keep on going. And he's writing to these believers. And he's writing to these believers from a God who is. A God who is present, a God who is available, a God who is able. That's what Paul says, isn't it? In Ephesians chapter 3, speaking of the Lord Jesus, to him that is able to do above all that you ask or think, exceeding, abund exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. He's the one who has perfect ability. What is it that they need? Not just the assurance of the God who is. What do they need? They need a fresh vision of Christ. And boy, do they get that in this letter, in this book. From the beginning to the end, let's, th uh, let's think about it. Just for a few minutes as we come towards the end of the meeting. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Verse 12, I turn to see the voice that spake with me. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes as a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. What was John's reaction when I saw him? I fell at his feet as dead. The glory of the risen Christ. That's what we need a vision of this evening, isn't it? The glory of the risen Christ. Of course, this was the risen Christ who was moving in the midst of the lampstands. This was the risen Christ whose eyes as a flame of fire saw and who, who um, was able to, to, to pick up and to assess with absolute accuracy and righteousness, the spiritual state of his people, the spiritual state of his assemblies. Now, oh, but he's the Christ who's interested. He's the Christ who is actively moving among the lampstands, the Christ who is actively looking out. Oh, he's the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the one who's the chief shepherd. He's the one who looks, who assesses, who commends, who corrects. Why? Oh, because he just wants his people to be doing well. And he wants his people to bring glory to him. And he wants his people to keep on going. And he wants his people to hold fast. And he wants his people to be encouraged and just to fix their gaze, their earnest gaze. Upon him, a vision of the risen Christ. What about chapter 5? Well, in chapter 5, and we turn to it so often, don't we? And we love to turn to it, and we love to think about it on a Lord's Day morning. And we love to think about the inscription uh, that, that is given to him uh, of uh, the, the one who's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. But who is it? He's the one who's worthy to receive the scroll. What is this scroll? Actually, I don't know. Different ideas, aren't there? Is it the title deeds of earth? 
Is it the unfolding? Is it the sealed prophecy that we get in Daniel chapter 12? The unfolding of the purposes of God? Well, because that's what he's going to do throughout the rest of the book. And we see him doing that. But he's the one who is worthy. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain. And hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests or a kingdom of priests and we shall reign on the earth. A fresh vision of the one who is our redeemer. The one who is the lamb freshly slain. The one whose sacrifice will never lose its effectiveness. The one whose blood will never lose its power. The one who, the one who alone is worthy. The one who stands out from all others. The one who's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The conquering hero. The root of David. He's the root of David. He's David's. Begetter, if you like. He's, he's David's um, author. But he's the one who's the offspring of David. He's the lamb of God's providing. The one who's worthy. The one who's worthy because of who he is. Oh, we can think of who he is. We thought of it, we thought already of the one who is the eternal God, the one who is and was and is to come. The one who's the the one who is incarnate, God incarnate, the one uh, the, the, the revealer of God, God manifest in flesh. The perfect, sinless, spotless man who stands apart from the whole of humanity. The one who is the only redeemer, the only sacrifice, the perfect saviour. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our service, of our love, of our worship. He alone is worthy. He's the one who, through the rest of the book, is the one who, following on from that, having received the book, he's the one who opens the book. He's the one who unfolds the purposes and the plans of God. And you see it. Uh, and you see it working out. Uh, and you see it brought into uh, fruition. Uh, and you see the one who is the unsurprisable God. Because nothing in this book takes him by surprise. And you notice that for everything that Satan brings out, God has his answer already. And so Satan has his man, who's introduced to us in chapter 6, when the man goes out on the white horse, and he's brought before us again in chapter 13, and elsewhere. And he's Satan's man. But before Satan's man is introduced, God has his man. His lamb. Who has overcome who has prevailed and who is absolute sovereign over all. And he's the one that Satan cannot introduce his man until the Lord Jesus starts loosing the seals. You see that? Satan's man cannot and will not be introduced until the Lord Jesus starts opening the book. The first seal is opened. And that's when it all starts. You'll notice too that before ever there are those who are sealed with a mark on earth in their foreheads or in their hands. Sealed as the servants of the beast. Sealed as servants of the Antichrist. As followers, as adherents of him. God has his servants. And before ever, 
man introduces his. The servants of God are sealed. We see that in chapter 7. We see amid the chaos and we see amid the turmoil and amid the judgment of the world, God has his people and there is a multitude that no man can number that comes out of the great tribulation. And God has his answer and God is in control. And the Lord Jesus has his hand over everything. He is the unfolder and the accomplisher of the purposes of God. He is, in chapter 14, the one who is the reaper of the earth. He puts in his sickle, the son of man, sitting on a cloud, puts in his sickle and the earth is reaped. He's the one who steps in personally in judgment. You know, earlier on in the week, I was thinking of that verse in chapter 8 and verse 1, where it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought how eerie that must be? How unnatural that must be? You know, the book of Revelation is the noisiest book in the Bible. As far as heaven is concerned, it's the place of continual uh, uh, continual praise. Uh, and there's so many different groups that praise. It's no wonder that there's singing in heaven. There's new songs that are sung in heaven. There's a new song uh, sung in chapter 5. There's a new song sung in chapter 14 by the 144,000 that are redeemed from the earth. There's, uh, there's a song of Moses and the song of the Lamb that's sung in chapter 15. There's ascriptions of glory to God that are pronounced time after time after time. There is constant noise in heaven, apart from this point where there's silence for half an hour. And this is just because, just before the Lord steps in personally and judgment is rained down from heaven. And you get the trumpets and you get the bowls. And it's the calm before the storm. But step in, he does, and the earth is reaped. Chapter 19. He's the one who's revealed from heaven. And here he comes. And heaven is opened. And the skies are split open. And it's like the lightning shines from one end of earth to the other end of, the, uh, uh, to the other end of heaven. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And I saw heaven open, verse 11 of chapter 19. And behold, a white horse. Second time. Second time in the book, a white horse is mentioned. First time is in chapter 6. The one who goes out on a, on a white horse is Satan's man, and here is God's man. Here is God's king. The one who is sovereign, who is over all, before whom his enemies cannot stand and must fall. He that sat on him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes as a flame of fire on his head were many diadems. Diadems, not crowns, not the victor's crown, not the, not the laurel wreath. The laurel wreath that fades over time. These are diadems. These are unfading. These are crowns. He had a name written and no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And so on. He's the one that treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. And for these believers that John's writing to and for John in his loneliness and his isolation in the Isle of Patmos, he has a vision. Of the coming Christ. The one who will be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on his adversaries. On them that know not God and obey not the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus is coming back. In chapter 20. We see not just the revealed Christ. But we see the reigning Christ. And he's the one who's reigning on earth. And he shall reign for a thousand years. What a time that will be. When they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, nations shall not learn war against nation. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Nations shall not lift up hand against nation, neither shall they learn war 
anymore. A time of unprecedented peace and unprecedented prosperity on the earth when the Lord Jesus reigns. Oh, it's great to, uh, great to think about it, isn't it? To have a vision of the reigning Christ. The end of chapter 20, a vision of the one who's rendering judgment. The one who now is saviour. The one who now is presented to men and women and boys and girls as the redeemer. Is the one who is the ultimate judge. He's the one who's qualified to pass judgment, isn't he? He's the one who's been here. He's the one who understands. He's the one who's grown up in a place like Nazareth. He's the one who's grown up in a family that didn't understand him and a family that didn't believe in him. He's been surrounded by sinners who rubbed shoulders with sinners and remained absolutely sinless and spotless. He's the one who's qualified to be the judge. And it's our Lord Jesus who will render judgment. Mind you, if we had that vision in our heads, if we had that vision before our gaze, and the awesomeness of it and the awfulness of it for those who will stand before that throne, What would it do for our evangelism? Moving on quickly, he's the one who in chapters 21 and 22 is resplendent in glory. Oh, there's no temple in that city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. No more is God hidden away, if you like. No more is he separated from the people. No more is he dwelling in the thick darkness. But he's there. And his people are in his immediate presence. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There's no temple. And the city hath no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Resplendent in glory, in majesty. Says the Lord Jesus to his Father, Father, I will. I'm determined. That those who thou hast given me be with me where I am. Why? That they may behold my glory. Brother and sisters, we're going to behold his glory. We're going to see his face. And we're going to be in his presence forever and ever. And in chapter 22, as we finish, he's the one who's presented before us as the one who's returning soon. Surely, he says, surely I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. So I come quickly and my reward is with me. Verse 12. To give every man according as his work shall be, mind you. Isn't that an incentive? Isn't that an incentive to live for him? Isn't that an incentive that we might have confidence, says John in his first epistle, and might not be ashamed before him at his coming? He's coming and he's coming quickly. We ask the sinners, are you ready for his coming? As believers, are we ready for his coming? Are there things that need to change? Are there things that need to be put right? Are there things about us that just aren't, aren't what they should be? Behold, I come quickly. He which testifies these things Verse 20 says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. A vision of Christ. The revelation 
of Jesus Christ. It was given to his people. Most of the book of Revelation is not about us, you know. It's not about us at all. First three chapters, well, first chapter, no, because that was John. Second, uh, second couple of chapters, that, that's about us. Right at the end, that's about us. But right in the middle, not about us, but it's for us. And it's for our encouragement. And it's to lift our gaze and to give us a vision of Christ, not just so that we can argue about the details, but that we can have a vision of Christ. And there's a blessing associated with the reading of this book and hearing and keeping the things that are written in it. I'll close with the words of the Lord Jesus to the church at Thyatira. He says, hold fast till I come. May the Lord bless his word. Shall we just pray? Our Father, we do thank thee for this time we've spent together this evening around thy word. And we are so conscious of our inadequacy as we think, our Father, of the greatness and the glory of our Lord Jesus, and we just cannot present him in all his glory and his majesty as we would want to, and maybe even as we should be able to, and certainly not as he deserves to be presented. We thank thee, our Father, for the one who alone is worthy. We thank thee, our Father, for the one who's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. We thank thee, our Father, for the ascriptions of praise and glory that there are to thee in this book. And our Father, we do pray that thou wilt just fill our gaze with a fresh vision of our Lord Jesus. That hearts that are sad and hearts that are heavy might be lifted and might be encouraged. And that we might all, our Father, live in the realisation that where those who have already gone before are, we soon shall be with them. We thank thee, Father, for the promise of the Lord Jesus that if I go, I will come again. And receive ye unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. But we are conscious this evening of present need. And we do pray for our sister Jeanette. And we do pray, Father, for Lorraine and Johnny and Rachel and Naomi and Karis. And we commit them very tenderly into thy hands at this time. And members of the wider family as well and members of the assembly here in Kennaway, draw near to them, our Father. Give help tomorrow as they'd gather to remember the Lord Jesus. And we know, our Father, the... The, the, the difficulties that come and we pray for strength and we pray for help at such a time as this. And we commit each one of us into thy hands and we ask thee that thou wilt help us to hold fast until the coming of the Lord Jesus. We thank thee for fellowship we can enjoy together. We thank thee for a cup of tea and refreshment that's been provided for us and we ask thy blessing to be upon us and our time that we spend together as we go home later, grant us safe journeys, our Father, we do ask thee. And we commit ourselves into thy hands as we give thee thanks. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.